fascinated by. Mm -hmm. So it's true. And what we found is um, in my own experience working with several different companies is compliance training was always so stuffy and unapproachable, right? It didn't really apply to the majority of people um, who took the training and it was very filled with legal terminology and, and talk and really high level. It didn't really get down to what I do and it would take me 45 minutes, you know, on each topic. Um, so that was our main focus with this project was to get, get it more approachable and shorter. Yeah, I, I don't know if anybody here in the chat is willing to admit this, but um, when uh, I'll, I'll be the first one because I don't think my boss at the University of Cincinnati is in here. So um, let's see, Karen or Jeff, if you're in here, I'm, I apologize in advance. Um, but uh, here's what happens uh, when I have to take the university compliance training. Um, I just uh, open another tab and wait till it, uh, I stop hearing things and then I click over and then I guess the answer. And if I get them all wrong, I get to take it again anyways until I get them right. So I'm not really learning anything. I'm learning how to yeah. cheat. And so, yep. uh, I, and um, that is the truth. I love to do the truth bombs. And so uh, that's exactly I'll admit what to it. <laughs> Yeah. So uh, you can just, uh, you see, look, everybody in the chat's like, oh, hell no, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not admitting <laughs> to that. Uh -uh. Thank you, Lisa. At least Lisa's over there going, hey, I'm with Andrew. It's very sad. It is true. <laughs> You know, um, it's okay. All of you guys can look deep inside and say, yes, I've done it. <laughs> right. um, so also uh, another thing that uh, we have done, and uh, Julie, it's, uh, we're gonna talk about your project, but we've actually figured out ways to make that so they can't uh, just click another tab and do something right. else. And right. so I don't wanna give all the secret sauce away, but uh, good <laughs> luck trying to do something else while you're taking one of our courses, because that is- Yeah, not this one. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I do want to get back to some of that um, uh, material. I know that we uh, looked at um, reducing this into uh, kind of the micro learning approach to the modules, and we have uh, three of those. I wanted to kind of uh, have you talk a little bit about the purpose and uh, what exactly uh, we have broken it into and, and kind of let you go from there. Okay, so our prior program um, was great as it was. It was effective, it did everything that it needed to do, um, but they were 45 minutes each. So exactly like you were saying, it was 45 minutes of very um, high level, but heavy content um, that you would sit through and then you'd get 20 questions at the end. You know, So you literally could run it and walk away. Um, so we knew that wasn't going to work for us anymore. We also knew that going into our new um, new company and our new culture, we wanted to lighten things up a little bit. Um, we wanted it to look like the people in it to look like us. We wanted it to feel like us. We wanted the conversation to be like us, um, even down to choosing our narrators. You know, so we wanted um, instead of someone that sounded very much like a judge. Um, or like you were in trouble, we wanted it to sound like somebody who sits next to you. You know, the the lady that sits next to you that you talk about where you're gonna go for the weekend. So we wanted to have a very casual feel to it. Um, and the, the biggest driver of everything was that time. We had to cut 45 minutes um, and that was per course and there were three courses. So we cut them to the, the number one goal is none of the courses could be over 15 minutes. So you present that challenge to um, attorneys and to trainers and to leadership. That's really, really hard to do. We did a lot of redlining, a lot of rewriting, a lot of negotiation, a lot of crying and tears. <laughs> but that was our number one driver. Um, and then the second was to make it more interactive and to, again, make it feel like it was something that spoke to our people. And for um, our end at Designing Digitally, one of the things that we wanted to do is we were looking at what they had and said, look, this, they have um, some excellent content material here. Um, and with building these um, to be shorter uh, learning experiences, uh, there's only so much you can do. Uh, you have to figure mm -hmm. out ways to um, simplify, condense, and or cut. 
Um, because one of the things I think is interesting about the micro learning side is it's not necessarily that we've come up with this amazing different approach to learning. Uh, we've just, um, we have just taken that age of instant gratification that we're in and figured out ways how to shorten these because we know we're competing for that attention span so much that we have to figure out not just those creative ways, but keep it short and concise. And All right. I mean, we can do a lot of fancy things and a lot of videos and um, but is it really necessary? There's a time and a place for everything. And our decision because we, we played around with the idea of doing comics and trying to do something that was um, funny and entertaining. But then we decided, you know, really to stick to that 15 minutes, let's just get in and get it done and get back out. You know, there's a time and place for everything, and we decided that wasn't for us at this at this point. And in regards to delivery of this, we were also very aware that this is something that is going to be delivered to you know twenty thousand uh, people, and we also know that within inside of those twenty thousand people, that's a very diverse group of individuals. Um, so we had to make sure that we balance the brand of Wyndham Destination, the messages from Wyndham Destination, but also uh, understand that we have to appeal to a large audience, which makes it um, much more complex than just let's shotgun blast this to everyone so that tone uh like julie's talking about one of the things that our team worked with julie to collaborate with was figuring out a tone that would uh, put this in a different context than what they're used to because like julie's talking about um a lot of times uh, we project that or we do a voiceover talent that's basically telling you or instructing you in a professional type of uh experience almost like your boss would be um with the approach that uh they came up with the tone the interactivity and the engagement um, what has happened is it's allowed for a more um, passive yet um, I think approachable way of doing a compliance training than what you may have seen in the past and so the cool part that I don't know if Julie's ready but uh, we did get because this is compliance we had to talk <laughs> to lawyers but we are allowed to show a few screenshots. So if anybody wants to see a few screenshots, we can uh, pop up a couple shots of uh, what it uh, started to look like. Um, and uh, we can kind of go from there, okay? Sure. So um, what we wanted to do is again, keep that really clean look. Um, we didn't want to do anything that was uh, fancy. You know, we didn't want to do anything that was glittery. Um, we just wanted to stick with a really basic black and white and gray color scheme. Um, the green represents our legal team. So we had to put a little color in for them. Um, but we did. We The whole purpose was just to keep this thing simple. Nobody loves to do compliance training. Most of us have done compliance training every year for our entire working life. Right. So we know it. And we just wanted to get in and get it done and, and move on. And so what we did, the I think what we did that was very different from what we've seen in the past is we we flipped that order. So like I said before, you used to see 45 minutes of content and then you'd have 20 questions that you had to answer. And nobody was watching the 45 minutes of content as often as they should. So what we decided to do is hit them with the questions first. So these first few slides you see here, they got a little bit of information up front, but then they would get hit with a question right away. And so if they got the answer correct, they would get simple feedback that basically said, hey, yeah, that's great. And maybe a little bit of information about why that was the right choice. But if they got it wrong, they got a lot more detail and they got um, a little more training. You know, so someone who was new to the corporate environment, um, this one's a neat one. I'll talk about that one too. Um, but so if you knew the content, you'd been there for a while, you've been, you know, doing these trainings, you can get done in 10 minutes. So that's a reward for paying attention. Um, you can't let it run because every slide is a question. Um, if you don't know the content, you'll be in it just a little bit longer. Yep. Yeah. And so was, one, go ahead. go ahead. No, you go right ahead. I'm sorry. I was going to talk about, let's see, have you gone through them all? There was one that's a no. checklist. Yeah, this checklist here? 
This one, yes. So this slide is one slide of content that originally in our 45 minute program, that was eight different slides. So that was about 10 minutes that we were able to cut off just taking out the fluff. Um, you know, it was redundant. It was overkill for what our people needed to know, explanations that we didn't need. Um, so by putting it in this format, we saved 10 minutes. So it's amazing and, what you can do when you're forced to. <laughs> right? That, that yeah. was one of the things. Uh, it was a real challenge to figure out how to be as concise as possible because yeah. um, information is important, but it's important to certain people. Um, so you need all the information or you need a little bit of information. So if you are working in compliance, we all say, well, they need to know everything so that we're oh, yeah. compliant. And that's not necessarily the case. Um, right. They need to know what to do so they don't violate a compliance um, uh, scenario or violate a compliance rule. So right. it's a better way of looking at it that way. Another and to thing answer that, Susan, Susan mentions that, you know, that's something that they aspire to. I tell you the way to sell this is to ask what they're keeping track of. Yes. So are they keeping track of what people get wrong? If they're not, if all they're looking at is a completion, then why do you need all that? Yep. You know, if we're not going back and actually checking what they got wrong and checking what they understand, then if let's just hit it with what we need to do and, and move on. Uh, exactly. That's exactly right. So also one of the things I want to say from our side from Design and Digitally, if you guys look at this interface right here, um, it's clean, it's simple. But one of the things that um, I want to point out is um, the actual uh, back forward pause menu buttons. Um, if you guys notice, they are not in the traditional bottom with the closed caption like it. everyone does. We here at Designing Digitally try to do something that is going to be different than what you're used to, but still follow strong UX and UI rules. And so uh, there are uh, ways, like you said, Julie, a lot of your staff and the people that have taken it have really liked it right there uh, because it's there. It's still out of the way. It leaves for a nice white space. Um, it's clearly easily, uh, easily read. And depending on how much content material we have, we can keep pulling down without having to scroll. And so it made life uh, a lot easier when uh, doing those layouts for this. We liked it too because um, part of our branding is a dot for you know your destination. So it worked out with our branding really well. We really liked it. And our graphic designers, I think, work side by side with you guys to mm -hmm. uh, provide concepts and say, hey, let's look at your brand. Let's look at your style. Let's look at your typography. Um, and not just let's slap your, your logo in the top left corner and let's rock and roll. Right. Uh, it right. was let's make sure that this is something you guys are very proud of and may possibly uh, change the look and feel of the future modules that you do. OK, well, it says Kara's got a question. Oh, yeah. What's up? Um, I can see it. Am I missing it? Uh, let me see. I don't. Uh, oh, maybe she has it in the in the questions part. Uh, I keep talking about Bloom's taxonomy. I've seen a pushback recently against using it for learning objectives. Um, have you seen any of that? Um, as far as the approach to the type of learning, the way that people learn is how Bloom's tax, uh, Blue Taxonomy actually works. So as far as those objectives, it depends on how you want to align those objectives. If you just want them to remember it, then that lower level is um, exactly perfect. But as far as um, how they're going to uh, align it against their learning objectives, in my opinion, your objectives and how they learn are, are two separate things. So I would assume that whoever is compiling those or bringing those together, um, they um, yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, there's actually a new set of verbs for that, but in in my opinion, he made he made the original, but there's a revised version also, um, which is for more of the digital age, I guess. Um, so you can argue that some of those work, some of them don't. Um, but in my opinion, um, for your objectives and the way people learn, um, I think 
uh, you can align it to a certain extent. Like if you want your objectives to be where they actually can go through a particular process, then you could do your higher levels of blooms where they're actually uh, interacting with um, a scenarios and a multitude of scenarios with outcomes um, to be able to provide that outcome, proving that they're able to do that. But uh, as far as those keywords, um, let, let them duke it out and let me know what they say. Um, now, on, back to uh, some of the stuff with uh, what we've done with destinations here. Uh, one of the things um, I have found uh, when working with Julie and working with their team is oftentimes uh, collaboration is extremely critical to figuring out exactly what you're going to be doing. And for our organization, what we do is um, rather than trying to pitch the ultimate solution to the problem up at the beginning, uh, what we have done is actually uh, pitched um, our approach and the way that we're going to make this happen. And with inside of that is a lot of collaboration with the actual um, customer, such as Julie. So uh, Julie, how much, uh, how much did you guys get to interact with our team and who did you interact with? And, uh, uh, you know, you can you can lay it on them. You can you can just <laughs> rip us apart. Feel free. No, it was wonderful. Um, I really enjoyed working with your team. So John uh, was the project manager, and he and I met every two weeks. So we had a standing uh, phone call, and um, it was great. He was really great about managing the project. He would show me um, where we were in our timelines. He would show me what was coming up. Um, and then I would also meet with the designers from time to time, depending on where we were, what stage we were and what decisions needed to be made. So my team, um, the legal and compliance team and the L&D team kind of popped in and out. Um, mostly it would be me attending those meetings, but it was great. Um, you know, we, we talked about a lot of different ideas. Um, John would come back to me with some things. They would just say, no, that's probably not going to work. Or, you know, they would come back with something that we hadn't even thought of. So it was really a great, a great uh, relationship. I enjoyed it. Yeah, thank you for that. I, I find that um, I, I told Julie this before. When we have collaboration with our uh, our partners, and we consider our customers our partners, um, when we collaborate with our partners, one of the things that uh, we find is if that individual or group of individuals are just as collaborative as we are, uh, it puts smiles on our team's faces. So um, when they have the meeting to go in with Julie, you should see they 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 are very excited to go in the meeting with Julie and them um, because they know that um, they have the opportunity to change the world indirectly by making something awesome with you guys. Um, we will never get to meet those 20,000 people that this has been deployed to, but what we do get to do is we get to go home knowing that we have indirectly changed the world through education. And that's exactly, believe it or not, and I may get wild by the end of this, we have that um, as a huge um, uh, um, vinyl print on our new sales office. So um, as you're walking up and down the stairs, it says education is the uh, best way to change the world. And awesome. so uh, in my opinion, that's very true. And thank you to Susan, shout out to Susan. She is uh, one of our partners. So, hey. Um, <laughs> Now, Julie, uh, talk a little bit about um, what exactly, as far as um, the implementation and um, your rollout and um, anything regarding that, so we can uh, really talk uh, in depth about uh, your experience with the project um, and um, what uh, things you learned along the way. Okay. Um, first, I'll answer Jonathan. Um, Jonathan asks, did you have to sell the project internally very hard and how did um, designing digitally help with those efforts? Um, how did we sell it internally? Was it very hard? It was not um, because we were in the middle of a spin, right? So our company parent company was splitting. So everybody had so much going on. Yeah. Um, essentially, I can't think of anything that's not changed this year. So everybody has been busy with projects and they pretty much let me have run of it. 
Um, we talked about with senior leaders about um, what we wanted, you know, what the, the look and the feel. And um, basically the rule was for me, do what you want to do as long as it doesn't exceed 15 minutes. <laughs> so I, I ran with it. Um, and designing digitally did help me with uh, making that happen. And we pleased a lot of people. I, I think people are very excited about the project. Um, I think that we exceeded their expectations. Um, and we met that goal of under 15 minutes. So they're they're very happy. Um, rollout and what we learned was also interesting. Um, being that we have 25,000 people all over the globe, um, we have people who complete a wide variety of tasks. Um, we are not standardized in terms of what equipment people use. So we have some folks using Macs. We have some folks using um, laptops. We have some that use virtual machines. So it's all over the board. Um, we don't have standards in terms of what browsers they use or how often those browsers are updated. Um, iPad users, Android users. I mean, we are just literally all over the board, even in terms of what their internet um, speed looks like and what their ability uh, to download, upload, you know, so it's, it's just a lot. So that was a challenge for us is creating these projects um, that would work for everybody. And so we spent probably a week longer than we anticipated in testing because we just couldn't get it to test out for everything that we wanted. We knew we wouldn't be able to test every possible combination. So we tried to focus on what was uh, a majority rules type of deal. And um, it was tough. It was tough. We actually did in order to make that um, as less damaging as possible. We had to decide what would be a good error rate, right? And we had to decide um, where we needed to make some changes. So we did have to go back and change a couple of interactions in order to make it work with Internet Explorer with the version that a lot of our people had. But we didn't have anything um, in terms of like video or um, heavy flash based stuff. So it, it really helped simplify that a little bit. Um, but I would say that was our biggest challenge was getting over browsers. Uh, we'll never get 100 percent. We know that. But I think we did a good job. I'm not hearing anybody having problems right now. So cross my fingers. <laughs> from from our side of designing digitally you should you guys should see this it's really funny um when they're doing the quality assurance testing we do a uh, multitude of rounds we do an alpha version internally and um so when they were testing this because we knew we had to do as broad range as possible um our team had ipads iphones <laughs> android phones galaxy tablets um the microsoft surface um, the all of the browsers we had a Mac we had a Linux um, box um, with chromium um, we were trying to do everything that we possibly could and then what we ended up having is like Julie's talking about one of the interactions that we actually developed um, was like a no bueno when it came to Internet Explorer but <laughs> everything else I mean I'm pretty sure it probably would have worked on the Blackberry <laughs> but not Internet Explorer <laughs> and so we ended up turning around and saying look instead of um, you know, us uh, troubleshooting this for over and over and over and over and over. How about we change the interaction um, because we know this type of interaction will be fine across the board. And so we actually came back to Julie and uh, we worked together to re um, storyboard that interaction and, and then uh, redevelop it out. And well, the when funny thing was that interaction was the same interaction that was somewhere else in that same course. I so know. it worked earlier for another question, but when it came up again, it, it didn't act appropriately. It was really weird. <laughs> I think it's because Internet Explorer is a union worker and they're like, we're only going to do it once. <laughs> After yeah. that, you're going to have to wait till tomorrow. I'm right. just kidding. I'm just we'll kidding. update it tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it'll be here tomorrow. We'll get it tomorrow. Um, <laughs> But that's one of the things, uh, and we, we get a uh, question that a lot like, hey, you know, what's the difference between you guys and somebody else? Well, 
you know, if you get an opportunity to come into our office and take a look when they're in the middle of testing and, and production and things like that, it is um, uh, people running around everywhere with a device testing and uh, talking to each other. And um, we just got done redoing the studio and now there's a big 55 inch TV with a uh, Chromecast. So now um, developers and instructional designers and designers don't even have to get up. They just have to look up and say, this is broken. Somebody fix this. So um, it's, uh, it's an interesting experience when um, uh, we get a project like this where we're testing a lot because uh, it might take that extra week, but it's definitely worth it because during that entire week, they are testing and putting in bugs. And I think, Julie, you can state this uh, or at least uh, back this up, I think. Uh, you know, when you first logged into our bug tracker, you probably saw a bunch of them and many of them may have been closed or a few of them may have even been open. And that's because that internal quality assurance is something that we do uh, big time before you guys even get your hands on it to ensure that you're not just getting here's what a freelancer sent you guys you guys tell us what's wrong now there's still things that needed to be changed and tweaked but we did do the internal quality assurance first and being someone um, I'm very structural and I like to document and note everything your bug tracker system was fabulous I really liked being able to see the notes on each item individually um, and being able to see the status and, and what was going on with that. So that is one of the things that I will compliment you on is that's that's a fantastic setup. Yes, I got one compliment. Yay! No, <laughs> no lots of compliments. I'm just, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, Julie brought up a good point. One of the things that our company has been able to see, which was very fascinating, um, is uh, now we can talk about it is uh, a lot of times we get the opportunity to work side by side with these companies. And uh, so we knew of the split, our company knew of the split uh, when you guys were uh, actually ramping up to make all of that happen because uh, since we work with um, the actual worldwide group, um, we actually had to help build some of that material that was training everyone on what's going to happen when the split happens. And so it was very fascinating to see all of those business parts and how that was working and and even for our head it was spinning and we're just you know focusing on this piece for you guys I can't even imagine um, now that the dust has kind of settled how uh, crazy that that uh, split and and um, and breaking off how many divisions actually broke off um, are you aware by chance so tough question we actually split the company into two so the hotel group went one direction and resorts and vacation ownership rentals went the other direction so wyndham worldwide um, had all of the corporate so everything that you would need in a corporate setting you know your accounting your brand management your um, human resources it all of those types of services each team had to recreate for themselves. So we had just, like I say, everything was in flux this year. Um, we are getting close. Actually, June, this is still June. This is our first year anniversary yeah. um, of being a, an independent publicly traded company. So it's, it's really exciting. We've just had some great things happening, bringing in some really awesome people. Um, it's fun. It's a fun time to be here. Did um, now did you guys one of the cool things also that we get to learn when working with companies is we get to learn um, some of the culture um, and some of the quirks and some of the fun things. Um, so do you, did destinations bring over the ho uh, the Halloween party? Are you guys carrying on the destinations Halloween party? <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, we do All a big right. Halloween party here every year. Um, it is fun. So we have a little friendly competition. Um, we, I think there's usually three categories. You can do scariest, uh, funniest, best team, and so there may be four, and best individual. So different floors will do, maybe the entire floor will join yeah. together and do one theme. Um, some teams will do that. And then at about two o'clock, we let everybody go home and get their kids and bring them in. And the kids do a tour. Um, and walk around and get more candy because we know they need more candy. Uh -huh. um, it's a lot of fun though. It's a good day. Not a lot of work gets done that day, <laughs> but it's a fun day. 
So to give um, everybody a backstory on this, uh, we started working with Wyndham um, Worldwide uh, about six years ago, and they've had this big Halloween uh, thing going on for many, many years. And uh, they actually got us into uh, the Halloween party. So now we have the Halloween party, uh, and we try to compete with you guys. And uh, because <laughs> of the split, though, and you guys going off, there really wasn't a big Halloween party this year. It was more like, um, yeah, we'll get to it this year. So um, I have a feeling that we might have a chance to compete this year at Designing Digitally. So you better be ready. We love to have fun. We have parties here, um, celebrations. We do a lot in, in terms of, uh, we're a vacation company, right? Yeah. So we should be having fun. We should be celebrating and um, kicking up our heels a little bit. And we've worked really hard this year. Um, so we do take time to make sure that uh, everybody is celebrated and and uh a little time to relax yeah um sorry for going on that side tangent i just no, uh, it's the Halloween stuff is <laughs> so much fun um so <laughs> back to talking about compliance training um yeah there were, there were three modules do you want to talk a little bit about uh, what those three 15 minute modules were um and what uh kind of we were touching upon in those three um just from like a high level yeah, so they're the standards. Um, the first one was our code of conduct. That was an entirely new code of conduct, new program for us. Um, we used to call it business principles, and that was tied to uh, the Wyndham Worldwide. Um, so we actually took the time to go back and rewrite all of that. I wish I had that to show you. Legal did that, um, and they did such a nice job with it. I see over in the in the chat, we were talking about um, learning objectives and saying, you know, the learner should know, blah, blah, blah. Um, when they rewrote the con code of conduct, they took that same approach to make it um, more relatable. And it basically said, we don't do this. We do this. So um, it, it just really brings your brings your associates into it, you know, so that they understand what they do and what they shouldn't do and what our culture is. So that was pretty awesome. I loved that. Um, your the program that you guys put together for us to support that code of conduct was fun. So we actually um, would give a scenario. Um, the scenario would put a person into a situation. Um, what was one of them? Oh, the restaurant. So yeah. there was one, the, the girl's been trying to get um, a reservation at a restaurant for a while. She knows that our one of our owner families runs the restaurant. Can she get into um, our records and get his phone number and give him a call? <laughs> so then our learner got an opportunity to, there were two or three choices on that. And then they would choose what's right. And if they got it right, thumbs up, you know, good job. If they got it wrong, okay, we need to talk about this a little bit and they get some more training around that. Um, so that was code of conduct. The other was um, anti-corruption. And so anti-corruption was aimed at our business development um, teams, those who deal with public officials, um, those who are negotiating for new resort properties, that type of thing. Um, and then we had um, information and privacy management. So, of course, that one's important to everybody. Um, everybody in business these days, we you know see so much about people getting hacked and systems getting hacked. So that's what that program was about. And from a technology side for us, um, we actually developed this out in Storyline 360. Um, and uh, the actual development is fully responsive. If you talk, uh, if uh, you guys were listening before, Julie was talking about how it had to work on each and every device. So what we actually did is developed it out to be fully responsive. Um, that way uh, we had the ability for it to be scalable um, and be able to work uh, without having too many uh, major tweaks to each one of the um, devices and the experiences. And so uh, depending upon what they're using and like Julie was talking about, since we have such a uh, wide range of uh, individuals, um, we also have another challenge that we're um, actually starting right now, which is um, we now have this 
uh, English version completed. And so now, uh, like we do with many of our clients, it is time to do the additional languages. Um, so Julie, what languages um, are we actually tackling with this? And uh, tell me a little bit about um, uh, where these will be deployed for those languages. Andrew, that's a good question. <laughs> That's the question of the day, the million dollar question, what languages? Um, so we originally had a request for 14 languages and we were going to do those um, over time because that's a big budget yep. um, item. So we were gonna do that over time and then the decision was made that, um, you know, we're, we're a true global company and we want to respect everybody that works for us and we need to, um, give them the training in their language and be inclusive. Yep. So we're trying to figure that out now, how to do that, keep a budget and be innovative. Yeah. <laughs> so we know that we'll do um, Latin American Spanish. We'll do that fully across the board. Um, we'll do Portuguese. We'll do, what was the other one we landed on? yesterday i think is thai yeah um but we still have to figure out how we're going to manage turkish greek indonesian chinese mandarin and cantonese yep yeah yep. yeah so oh, we're ooh. still working on that Ooh, jonathan wants to add bubble talk and pig latin but i think uh <laughs> I, think, I don't know if we have those in a budget but we'll try jonathan um well, I tried to get Kentucky in, you know, I sound different than everybody else, but they wasn't budging on that. <laughs> this ain't exactly English. <laughs> hey, I'm from Ohio. We, we, I don't know how we didn't get that from you guys. I have no idea. I thought it would bleed over. Um, yeah, the the, the uh, funny part about translations for all of you that um, you might already know this, um, you may not. A lot of times uh, when we do the localization and translations, um, Julie pointed out, she said um, Latin um, American Spanish. Um, you got to make sure that with your localization that Spanish in Spain is not the same as Latin American uh, Spanish. And uh, I state that because Andrew about 13 years ago learned the hard way uh, <laughs> when we were went back when I was project managing. Um, and uh, so just taking into consideration that localization also is the localization of that language and not necessarily just because it's English, it's English or just because it's Spanish. Spanish is Spanish. Um, we have found that, uh, like Julie's talking about, I'm not picking on Kentucky, but uh, I, I was telling Julie this. Uh, I have uh, we have a client that uh, is in uh, Memphis, Tennessee, and I was just telling Julie I love talking to them because of their accent from the Tennessee accent. It, it's so fun. Like, and but when I go to California, people are like, "Oh, you're from the Midwest, aren't you?" And I'm like, "What do you mean?" <laughs> Like I don't, I don't want to. They know I'm from that. I figured it was because I was just a heavier, short guy. But I think it's, <laughs> I think it's the voice or the way I conduct my sentences. So um, keep that in mind. Um, make sure you don't do uh, uh, Latin American Spanish for um, Spain Spanish. Uh, right. Otherwise, you will be yelled at tremendously. Even I think the difference in um, Spanish between Puerto Rico and Mexico is is different. Oh yeah, you're right. It is. Yeah. Um, and you know, it's also funny. There's, um, what was it? Um, like Brazil and Argentina, they have just slight modifications, but you can get away with, uh, keeping them since they're close enough that no one really is going to complain. But, uh, we have had some feedback, like we wouldn't say that word in Argentina, um, in some of the feedback. And so, uh, you just don't know, um, what exactly you're going to get when it comes to those different languages. Yeah. Uh, Brazil no, is 14, but there's uh... also a lot of Spanish speaking, uh, people in Brazil. So we've had to do, um, we've had feedback on both of those. This was my first time working on um, a global project of this size. And I tell you, that was the biggest challenge for me, um, especially being from small town Kentucky, right? So thinking about, um, we have an awesome, 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 awesome um, 
manager of inclusive uh, inclusion and diversity. And she, that's just an amazing role to have in a company, right? So you don't see yeah. that very often, Yeah. but I sat down with her and went through these and the things that she pointed out in just in photos, um, in some of the language, it was just amazing to me. The things that I had never thought of perspective, um, how people might see a face, uh, a look, um, an item of clothing, how they might see that differently than, than what we take for granted here in the States. Um, that was a really cool opportunity. I learned so much by working with her on this project. Yeah. Um, there was a project that we were working on, uh, I think last year where, uh, we had some 3d mm -hmm. models and the females, um, it, that had two scandalous <laughs> clothing and it was just a v-neck shirt, but we got, uh, some feedback on it. So, uh, again, this was, um, an already developed module that was in the U S but was actually translated into another language. And when that took place, uh, because of the cultural, um, and the differences, uh, we actually had to redress the 3d models, mm -hmm. which I thought was amazing. Yeah. Something you don't think about until you get into that world. It's a, a really interesting opportunity. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, um, another thing that I often see when we're looking at uh, translations and localization is a lot of people look at just uh, what's on the screen, but you also have to do every little aspect of menus, buttons, um, yeah. Uh, you have to do uh, congratulations screens, screens that they may never see. And a lot of times uh, those things are forgotten or the people just uh, assume that they need to do them or they're not even on their radar until you start to actually build an asset list. And then you go, oh man, we really shouldn't even have put the submit button on that or the word submit on that button. We should have just mm -hmm. made it an arrow or something like that because you find that you're then redoing it over and over and over. And then, yeah. um, each and every time what we ended up doing is um, they're built um, so that uh, we are building them out dynamically, which allows us to change those and uh, redo that um, uh, translations. But at the same time, you still have to go through and redo it and rebuild the pieces because um, a sentence in Spanish compared to a sentence in English may not align with any animation or any um, uh, wording that is coming up on the screen at the current time. Um, so you have to look at that and just uh, basically uh, make a uh, additional version for uh, developing out each language. And so uh, that becomes, like Julia's stating, uh, tedious. And not only that, then we have to quality assurance those um, mm -hmm. with somebody within that language that can actually do that equivalent quality assurance. And that's where uh, Julie was talking about finding the Greek, if you saw the look on her face, like, and hey, we're going to do Greek. And, da, da, da. and it's because uh, both her and our firm uh, need to make sure that we have quality assurance um, in somebody in that native language to be able to make sure that uh, we're putting out the output that we put out um, in English at the same quality and with the same message. Right. So Kara asked, um, did these translations end up being like new builds? I think that was that was something that was a shock to my, my team, um, the legal uh, compliance and ethics and some of the other people that don't work in our industry. Um, they were a little, had sticker shock, right? Well, gosh, if the original course was this much, why are we paying this much more for translations? All they have to do is get it translated. And so I did have to take that opportunity to go back and say, all of these buttons, all of these words, everything has to be redone. The interactions have to be rebuilt. I mean, all we're left with is boxes and arrows, right? Yep. So, and the photos stay. So every word that you see has to change. Um, so once I was able to explain that, they're, they're feeling a little bit better about the budget, <laughs> but it's still tight. Yeah. Yeah. And as you guys know, uh, 14 different languages times three modules um, can can be pretty hefty. Um, but mm -hmm. as Julie knows, we try to do everything we can to work with inside of those budgetary constraints. So yeah. um, yes. and that's what we're doing with Julie and their team to say, hey, what can we do? What can we uh, work together to try to uh, cut workload off of you guys, us um, to make sure that we can keep this within inside of a uh, reasonable budget for you guys? 
And that's on us. That's our internal struggle, you know, is trying to figure out um, how to be fiscally responsible. Um, does it make sense to spend $15,000 to translate for three people? You know, so that's where we're trying to get into that. Um, how can we be innovative and deliver a great experience for those few people um, and not make them feel second class, but not spend $15,000 um, on that? So we'll get there. It takes us a little bit of time, but we'll get there. Yeah. And uh, I think everyone ends up with an expense like that. And it's just if we could just use the Google Translator, oh, man, life would be great. But <laughs> yeah. uh, unfortunately, we don't have that yet. So here, here's your million dollar idea right here, everybody. Right. right. That's perfect. Better get on this or something um, is to take uh, and make an AI machine that will actually scrub your entire course and pick localization for that. So yeah. there you go. Where's uh, where's Mike and uh, the rest of the team at Rest City? Let's get them on this, or the risk people, or somebody. Go. Um, yeah, we need a Star Trek Universal Translator too. When you're there. <laughs> um, Look, I'm gonna go off. I'm gonna go off on a little tangent here. Go for it. Kara says she's from Kentucky, so I gotta know in true Kentucky fashion, cats or cards. Oh, she's she's a cats girl. Yeah. Oh no. Yeah, so she's a new alum. yeah, I knew that. Yeah, she's actually at OSU now, so now she's a Buckeye. Oh, so, okay. Yeah. But I think her heart's at, at UK. I think oh, her, boy. her career is at OU. Yeah, see, that's all right. We can still get along. <laughs> um, anybody else from the local area? I know we got a few people. Uh, where's everybody from? Uh, if you guys want to just uh, post in there. Um, yeah. Um, ah, okay. That makes sense why you would be a cat fan. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm from a town called Bondsville, Ohio. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of that. Um, but it's super small. You got a little Washington, Madison, Wisconsin. All right. Dallas. W for Molly. Memphis, Lewisburg. Hey, I know where that's at. <laughs> Susan probably has an accent like mine then. You know what? <laughs> she does, but she's good at hiding it. Oh. She's good at hiding it until she starts yelling at me. And then it comes <laughs> The only East Coaster is Lisa. So where are you, the East Coast? I didn't see. Let me scroll up. Did Lisa say? I know you don't yell. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Connecticut. Connecticut. All right. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. Absolutely it is. Anyone else? I see a couple other uh, Ohio people that are hiding in here. You ninjas. <laughs> like, everybody's like, I'm not speaking up. Yeah. Dayton. We're in just below Dayton. Rose, we're in Franklin. In between Cincinnati and Dayton, right off I-75. I can throw a baseball and hit a car on 75 right now. <laughs> Jonathan, I'll fly away should only be sang, sung with a uh, Southern accent. That's true. <laughs> it's only proper. <laughs> All right, here's one other question. Let me see if I can add a question. Um, iced tea, ready? <clears throat> Sweetened or unsweetened? <laughs> On oh, see, so we got a lot of unsweetened half and half. Oh, you cheaters! Yeah. Uh, see, that's what happens when they go from the south to the north. <laughs> How about Arnold Palmer style with lemonade? That's me. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That would I, I'm down for that. Let's do yeah. that. Uh, the reason why is like I grew up in the north, so unsweetened tea was like, is it is it, is the cutoff Kentucky? That's what I want to know. It's like it started in Tennessee where they're like, that's where the sugar starts. Yeah, probably. Probably so, that's. Is Kentucky like the gray area where you guys just have this civil war over sweetened and unsweet tea? It must be <laughs> it. Because honestly, I'll let you know, I'm actually from southern Indiana. I'm from a town called Jeffersonville, Indiana. Yeah. Um, but I would say that I'm from Louisville, Kentucky because I don't sound like Indiana. So the way Indiana is divided, um, the accent changes every hour that you drive south. 
<laughs> the accent changes. So I've got that more Southern. Um, but I'm an unsweet tea girl. I don't like that sweet sugar. All right, me either. Yeah, <laughs> so I think my, it is Kentucky. <laughs> I'm sure I'm figuring my tea there. Yep. Kentucky's our break point, everybody. We figured it yep. out. <laughs> anybody kind of see, if I say, can I have some iced tea? And I think this is really funny. And this is a South thing. When I uh, asked for iced tea and I said, Un, uh, unsweetened, please. The first thing everybody says to me is, bless your heart. And I was yeah. like, oh, everybody's so nice. Until this lady turned to me and goes, yeah, that uh, that doesn't mean what you think. <laughs> and I was just like, oh, you stupid Yankee. You stupid, stupid Yankee. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately. <laughs> It's something we learn to do very young. <laughs> yeah, uh, at least you guys are polite about it. You know, most right. people in Ohio are like, all right, dummy. So <laughs> you guys are polite about it. Um, I do want to say we're coming to the end of uh, the hour. Um, and I wanted to, Julie, just kind of give you um, the chance to, uh, if there was anything you wanted to share or say or um you know, anything of that nature. And and I will tell you, everybody, you know, Julie is very, very busy. So try not to spam her uh, after this <laughs> meeting. Uh, trust me, I have to take a number. Uh, so um, if you guys, um, you know, do have questions, you can find her on LinkedIn. Um, but mm -hmm. Julie, is there any other items that you would like to share? Um, no, I, you know, I think we covered this project really well and, and talked about the things that I love about it. Um, I think we talked about the challenges. Um, I appreciate your compliments. I saw a lot of you guys saying nice things about the project, so I appreciate that. Um, it was a little um, nerve wracking for me because I was taking it in such a different direction as um, anything that we've done here before. Um, but I, I'm really happy with how it turned out. And thank you for inviting me to talk with you today. This was fun. Yeah, I, I greatly appreciate it. Um, you know, we love being a partner with you. Uh, we look forward to working with you guys again. And um, if anything does come up or uh, anything that uh, you ever want to share, if you ever want to nerd it up on this again, I'm hoping to get people <laughs> like to join me and a couple other people if they get uh, permission. And um, I think by now, you know, uh, when we do share this stuff, we don't want to give anything away. So if you guys notice, you really don't see anything regarding the rules and regulations for uh, window destinations, compliance training, you just saw some screenshots because uh, we are um, we have non-disclosures and we want to be very respectful of the information that we are provided. Um, again, I made that comment about knowing about the split. Like our company is uh, completely silent and the doors are locked. And um, uh, I was telling Julie earlier, we even destroy hard drives, which uh, if you get to work here, uh, it's fun. When we do new computer days, <laughs> we strip them and we take them out back with a sledgehammer. And uh, as long as you're wearing goggles and uh, um, a uh, the gloves you go to town enjoy so um you know with that said i just want to say thank you julie for joining us uh, thank you to everybody that uh came out today to listen to uh, the experience between a uh, company that is trying to uh, help uh, companies like Wyndham destinations and thank you julie um, you guys are growing uh, you got a lot of work on your plate already um, so thank you for taking the time to join mm -hmm. us and thank sure. you to Luis and to the tld uh cast and to everybody that joined us uh we appreciate uh, your time today and until we speak again Stay creative. Bye, guys. Bye, everybody. I say bye, y'all. Bye, y'all. <laughs>